Jared pulling Frono's photo. Dot com and recently b and asked me to speak at their inaugural Build Expo in New York City. And they said I could talk about whatever I wanted. And what you're about to see right now is the recording of what I decided to talk about. And it's not something that most people would have ever expected me to talk about. And that's why I wanna share it with you because it is close to me, it's close to my heart, it's near and dear to me. And I think it's gonna resonate with a lot of you guys out there. So if it does resonate with you, just leave a comment down below so I can read what you have to say and how it made you feel. But also understand that this was taken from the live stream, so the quality may not be up to the normal standard that you're used to seeing from us, but it's about the content that I'm talking about. So here it is, enjoy. Hi everybody. I'll do my intro, because that's how I usually like to start. Jared Poland Frono's photo. <laughs> Dot com. I mean, Some, some people absolutely hate it, because I've been saying it all the time, but the thing is you remember it at this point, because I've said it eight billion times. It also meant that people got my name right and stopped calling me Poland and call me Poland, because people got it wrong all the time. So I want to talk about photo stories and personal projects. Uh, photo stories are something that, I mean, it's self-explanatory. It's a bunch of photos that put together tell an amazing story. And anything can be a photo story. It could be a manufacturing plant. You can find images anywhere, right? You can, you, it could be going on the road with Bernie Sanders, which is one of the things that I did as a photographer. I wasn't hired by them, I was invited out. So I go and I document whoever I'm there to document. So it doesn't matter what affiliation you are, you just go and you do. And you use your, I kind of use my camera as a shield because I'm hidden behind it and my emotions are hidden behind it. So photo stories are, are important to me, and I'm gonna share a photo story with you today, and, and these guys were afraid of what Fro Uncensored meant, because the truth of the matter is they came up with some title that I didn't even like, and I said, just call it Fro Uncensored, but they didn't know I didn't know what I was gonna talk about yet. So that's why we called it Uncensored, so that I can talk about whatever I want to talk about, and in this case, it's the photo stories and the personal projects. When I'm doing photo stories, I'm going after four things, wides, mediums, tights, details. I hammer that home in my brain when I'm doing any type of photo shoot because there's those times where you take pictures and you're like, well, what am I supposed to do next? And then you realize you just shot it at one focal length and you forgot about the story. You forgot about the wider shot that establishes the scene. You forgot that you get in a little closer to fill the frame. You do the, the portrait is your tight shot and then your details, of course, are your details. And I, and I think personal projects are some of the most important things to do, because people always talk about, what am I supposed to do? I don't, I don't have a job, I didn't get a gig, I'm not getting hired by anybody. But put yourself out there with an idea for a project that you want to do, and do it. Just do it. Oh God, I sound like a meme. <laughs> Just do it. But what, what I mean, I've gotten so many things out of personal projects. I've reached so many people because I've put myself out into the world, reached out to people, showed them what I could do, and just said, look, this is what I want to do. You don't have to pay me. I'm just, I want to do this. And not getting paid has led to getting paid. So I just want to get that out of the way. I'm going to leave time at the end here to do a Q&A because I know people always have questions. They don't have a microphone for you, so you're going to yell it at me and I'm going to repeat it. Um, but I want to talk about a personal photo story. That's the direction I want to go. So this is, what's this? What month is this? Wow, that's small. I can't read. Can someone tell me what that says? Of 2007. Th this is my mom. Now, she wasn't doing too well, and we rushed her to the hospital. And we didn't know why. We didn't know what was up. She wasn't doing well for a couple of days. And I also so happened to get a Nikon D3 right around that time. Um, I mentioned the gear. The gear doesn't mean much, but it just puts the time into perspective. The D3 just came out, the 14 to 24, 28, the 24 to 70, 28, and that stuff revolutionized photography because the D3 is one of the greatest cameras ever made. It's still a fantastic camera. Um, but I grabbed my camera, I grabbed my camera bag, which was my mom's camera bag at the time, but I had my gear in it and I went to go shoot. I got yelled at by the nurses at first because they said HIPAA, HIPAA, and I'm like, I don't care. 
And so I, I'm like, this is my mom. I'm going to take pictures, which is a selfish thing because I'm selfish in certain ways. And I think as photographers, we're all, we're all selfish. We, we want to get the shot. I didn't intend to do a photo story. A photo story is just what came out of this. And so from this, this is one of those establishing type shots. I, I should also say, I haven't re-edited these since way back in the day. So I edited the way that I edited the raw files back in the day. This is how they're going to look right here. Um, but as an establishing shot, it's pretty good from a storytelling standpoint in my mind. It's wide enough. We can see my mom in the bed. We can see the, the notes, the barcodes, the things on the walls, the things that you don't want to forget about in a story. And so you can see my dad's foot. Now, it's not something you would see in the bottom left corner that you might know, but I know because I, I took it, and I know that's my dad wearing like New Balances or something back in the day. He, he now has better shoes. He likes to have his Adidas or something, or Under Armour. Um, so with a story, I'm always working different angles. I'm always moving around. I'm not afraid to be seen. Right? Do you know how many people sneak out of the rows here and they're all like... <laughs> they, they can see you, right? Don't worry about it. Just own it. Own the space, right? Own your photography. If you're going through the aisle, walk with purpose. Get to your spot. Sit down. Get your shots. Um, so just moving around. Getting something that's establishing even from a different angle, a little wider. We see my dad's wearing an Eagles shirt, right? This is... We're all waiting to see what's going on. And they're running a bunch of tests. You're capturing all of the things on the walls. We're telling those stories. Coming in a little closer. I love using out of focus things that draw you into the scene. I just, I just, it just adds dimension where dimension doesn't exist. Photography is a 2D, 2D medium. And in this case, we're able to give it some dimension. Also, black and white, I, I've always been a proponent. I love black and white. I shot a lot of black and white film back in the day. I loved processing in the dark room. Um, but this just brings you in even closer. So I would consider this to be one of those medium type shots that helps tell the story as you're moving forward. And then just something a little wider, taking a step back. And there's only so much you can do in a room like this, but I think it all builds. And I didn't know where I was going with this at, at the beginning when I was taking these photos, but we were waiting. It was like 9, 10 o'clock at night. We were waiting for one of the doctors to show up to try and give us a better understanding of what was wrong. And one of the doctors came by and he's like, I'm pretty sure it's cancer. He, like, I don't know what type it is, but with his expertise, he's like, I think this is what we're going to find out. And that's what I think we're working with. We're going to keep her in for observation and we're going to start to run some tests and figure it out. So this is the next day. What's the date say again? 22nd. 22nd. As a, as a photographer, it's not good to be blind, and I so happen to not see very well. So um, this I don't consider to be one of those images that would stand on its own. Photo stories, they don't all, all the images in them don't have to stand out on their own, right? It's not just one image that pops. Now, you can have images that stand out, but I think in the story, it's okay to have ones that aren't the best of the best, but they still convey a message. This is the next day. We're waiting. You've got the crappy food on the, on the table. You've got, the, I guess, the Frosted Flakes, which is probably the worst thing you could ever eat with the sugar. Not very good. But the flowers in the background, right? Those are from the garden. My dad grew those. He plucked them. He put them there. So I, I just love backgrounds of images. You know, her friends came. So sharing laughs. It's, it's, not like I'm, it, it's almost like I'm not there, right? They're, they're ignoring me, which is normal. You know, leave me alone and just let me do what I do. And sharing a laugh. Excuse me, sharing a laugh with friends here. And then a tighter one. Like I said, this isn't something that, that I think stands out. But the reason I like it is we have my grandmother in the background, Lil. How many people watch my old, 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 old videos with Lil in it? Anybody? We've got some here. I have about 100 videos with, with Lil and I where I would ask her questions on YouTube for five, six, seven minutes, and she would sit there and say, come see, come saw, and the same things over and over. But it was funny. So we've got Lil here. We've got my mom in the background. And we jumped to December 23rd, which so happens to be my mom's birthday. Uh, unfortunately, she and my dad were supposed to go to Las Vegas, and that ended up not happening because... She was diagnosed with cancer at this time. 
Um, and so we had to celebrate her birthday here. Now, if anybody's wondering if you should light candles in a, in a room, the answer is only if you ask them and they check that the oxygen is off because they made sure that the oxygen, oxygen is off. But I love wide establishing shots. That, that's one thing that I got wrong. Uh, actually, I want to go back to, that, to this because I always want to, I always tell people that what's the point of taking a super tight headshot if you can't tell where the environment is. So if you're in Paris at the Eiffel Tower, and you can't tell you're in Paris at the Eiffel Tower because you can't tell that you're there, then what was the point of even doing it? So try to convey the scene as best as possible while working in the environment that you're in. Look at the, look at the door. There's a photo of me wearing a wanker shirt. That's me, right? I'm wearing a shirt. Then there's my dad and my brother officiating. So, there's pictures inside of pictures. I see so many people take tight images, say it's a baby and, and the mother, the father are sitting there and it's just a tight shot. But what they're forgetting is on the walls, you have family members' pictures, you have stuffed animals around, you have memories from their childhoods that if you capture that, that's something that lives on for the history of those people and the history of the image. So we've got my brother, we have my sister-in-law, we've got the candles being blown out, and I just think it's a, a very good storytelling image. We got Lil here, bottom corner, smiling with her fake pearls. They're not real. Um, it, it's important to move around. Just don't stop. Once you get a shot, just keep moving, find the different angles, but don't keep redoing the same thing over and over. And that's the reason you'd switch different lenses or you switch focal lengths. And I don't care so much about the gear. And I know people don't really believe that because all the videos that I make are, a lot of videos are about gear, but part of the reason we make videos about gear is those are the videos that people wanna watch. And that gives me a, a, an outlet to talk about other personal projects and photo stories and that ho hopefully people do transition and watch as well. Um, but again, the flowers, you've got the flowers up in the back that my dad picked. So that's why they're there again. And I just think it's important to get Lil in here. And you got mom and Lil. These aren't the you know, standalone shots, but as a family and as part of a, a storytelling series, it works. My brother, his sister, sorry, his sister. My sister-in-law, I don't have a sister. Um, the, the interesting thing here was, from a personal standpoint, I definitely hid my emotions away. I used the camera as a block for my emotions. It's just what I did, and I'm, I, I hide them pretty well. And I felt at this time that my brother had someone to fall back on. Um, I felt like I didn't really have anybody there for me. You know, I had to be strong for my dad. And that's why I felt like I had to put on a, a strong front to be there for him. My brother had his wife. My dad had me. I didn't really have many people to support me in that moment. But, you know, we still didn't know what was going on. We didn't know what she was being diagnosed with. Then we've got Lil. I kind of like this. The, um, the composition isn't a normal composition that I would go for, but again, the flowers played a part in it. So vertical, usually I would want to keep the eyes in the, in the top third. That's where I like to do it. Um, but the red flowers, I just really like the feel of the, the stoic look that Lil put on here. Lil was a tough woman. She was, she was a tough woman. She had to deal with, uh, she was born in 1910. And she lived to uh, seven days shy of 104. So she, uh, she saw quite a lot, if you think from 1910 on till, uh, you know, whatever that number adds up to. Math wasn't my strong point. That's why I'm a photographer. <laughs> French wasn't my strong point. I got a D minus in that, by the way, in ninth grade, which then sent me into photography. So thank you, French, for failing, or almost failing. Um, just a picture, mom, dad, just, just to have it. Not, not one of the best of the best of the best with honor, sir, but something that we could work with. Um, so they did a lot of prodding and probing. They were taking like liver biopsies, which is, sounds terrible when they do it because you're awake and they're putting like a corkscrew through your back trying to get to the liver to figure out what you have and to type it. 
Um, she ended up with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and it wasn't the, the, the quote-unquote good kind, the one that you live with and you die with. Uh, it, it's one that was a little more aggressive and more difficult. So one of the courses of action is chemotherapy. And this is where you get into more of the detailed shot. I drove her to the first session uh, for the chemotherapy, and I always found it interesting that you know, they're putting this ba these bags of poison in you, and they're handling it with uh, gloves and masks, and they're literally putting this into you. They can't touch it, but they're putting it into your body, which is, which is extremely difficult, I, I think. With, uh, think. Um, and so people always ask, where, where did the hair come from? Now, I started growing a fro before Frono's Photo launched, which was in 2010, and at this time, we said that if, if my mom ended up losing her hair, that I would give her mine. And thankfully, she didn't end up losing her hair. I got to keep mine and launch a website, which, which I guess is, is important because it kind of played a role in that. Um, but from the storytelling standpoint, we move into the tighter shot. This tells the story of what's going on. We've gone from, look, I didn't know where the story was gonna go. It was just me documenting along the way. When I do photo stories now, it's usually I spend a day, I spend two days with someone, I capture every moment of what's going on to tell the best story possible in the images, but this was just an ongoing project. Um, the day after chemo, they're getting ready to go to a, a family member's bat mitzvah, and my dad's waiting patiently, or impatiently, probably, for, for them to get ready to go, but my mom is totally amped up for whatever reason. I guess she was running on adrenaline at the time. Um, and this is our house, kitchen, all the memories, all the things that are there. Look at the refrigerator. You may not be able to see the images right now, but in other images, you, you will. Uh, those are the type of things I still like to capture in the story. Um, I'm not afraid to go with some slower shutter speeds in certain situations. I know a lot of people talk about just freezing the action, freezing the moment, and that is important, but sometimes you wanna go with a slower shutter speed to convey the movement. Um, and there's a difference between something that's motion blur because you just use the wrong shutter speed, or something that just works because there is some movement, but it helps tell the story. Right? I just, I love this angle. I love using the natural light coming in from wherever it was coming in, just playing around, just composing, just exposing, and then just capturing. And you can see the room's purple. I wear purple. I don't think it was my choice to make that room purple, but I, I, I do like the purple. It's not that color anymore. Um, this is where you can see the slower shutter speed. My mom's moving, Lil's moving, my dad's still waiting here, just playing around with different angles, just they're getting ready to go. Classic shot, let's show the outfits. They were TikTokers before their time. You know, they're just, just getting ready to go. Huh. Getting ready, door. I probably would edit this in black and white these days if I had to do it again. Um, but I just like the look. I like my dad going around the back of the car after opening the door. I, I like my mom making eye contact with me. You know, it's an interesting thing. Like, was she okay with me taking pictures, right? Is that something people are thinking, was she okay with it? Um, she was okay with me capturing the moment. She was okay with me telling the story. And then, well, what, what date was this last one? What's that say, January 12th? And there's a reason I jump all the way to October, because from January to October, all the treatments were working. Everything was going well. And so that didn't seem like a reason to just take random photos. She was doing the everyday things. She was in uh, the choir at synagogue and driving herself and, and just going about her life until it morphed. The cancer morphed and she wasn't doing well. And so she would sleep in my brother's bedroom. My brother's no longer there, he's out of the house. Um, my room was on the other side of the wall because I still lived at home then. And she would cough like all night. The cancer was pressing on the lungs, which was causing her to cough. And you know, my dad's sitting here, he's watching TV, my mom's laying there. And I, I 
I'm pretty sure I recall them talking about if she was to die, that he should continue on. He should find someone, he should go live, right? So it's not the easiest thing to capture, but again, I'm still hiding my emotions behind the camera at the time. And for anybody who remembers my earliest videos, the, this is where I made them. I made them in this room uh, when I first started. That's where I put the iMac, that's where I made those early photos. So I, I like this because I believe my mom is looking at my dad here. She's looking at him. She's making the eye contact. And now they're both watching the TV. I work my way around the room, right? Something a little more behind the scenes. It's kind of like they don't even know I'm there. I mean, you get that feeling a little bit? They're just letting me be. They're letting me do my thing. Again, I still don't know why I'm doing it. I'm just doing it because that's all I knew. That's all I knew was to tell the story. I think they're watching the Rat Pack or something. And you see there's a lot of wides. Now we jump, what, two days forward? She's freezing. She went through the, the she would sweat. She would then be freezing. And in this case, she's obviously wrapped in multiple blankets. I, I see with the clock, you can see the time. I always think it's important if there, there is a clock there, you capture the time. I probably wasn't thinking about that when shooting. It's one of those things you just compose and it just so happens to be there. So that's, that's something that I'm always looking for. What are the things in the background that might help tell the story when they're in the images? You've got the crackers by the bed in case she gets hungry. You've got the medication, the slippers on the floor, the window is slightly open, all the different colors that are in it. We're just, we're just capturing, right? I'm in there. Two days later again. Now it's a little later in the day. Again, just not feeling well. Super tired, coughing all the time. Oh, you see the grain? Does anybody care? I mean, I, so many people care about noise and grain. I know not to take it totally out of the story, but uh, I'm not a fan of noise reduction softwares. I, I find that no one cares about the noise and grain in your images. You've been trained by people to tell you that noise and grain is bad. But when we developed stuff back in the day in the dark room, when we had 3200 Delta or whatever the Ilford stuff was, you had noise, you had grain. It was what it was. It, it wasn't meant to be perfectly smooth. And, and, and a lot of the, the grain that you see that's removed today, it just smooths out your image and makes it look like a watercolor painting, which just isn't a good look in my opinion. I think just embrace the grain. And with today's technology, you have the ability to shoot at such high ISOs with much cleaner images that it's perfectly fine. So now we jump to October 22nd, not much later there, and she is really not feeling well at this point. She can't get warm. She's wrapped in the blanket. She's holding her tea. You can see the, the orange bottle is the medication. That's some medication that's supposed to... Uh, alleviate the, the, the coughing, but it obviously doesn't work very well. Um, you have the refrigerator. On the refrigerator, we've got my grandfather, and we've got photos of me, and we've got photos of cats, and all the family memories. These are things that you don't want to forget to capture in whatever story, whether it's happy, whether it's sad. Um, in this case, my mom sent me out of the room. She asked me to stop taking photos. She was not, not feeling it. And I, and I left the room, and then I, and then I came back, and I, and I said to her, I said, sometimes you have to capture the bad with the good. Not everything is going to be good. And as photographers, we have to document what we see. And so in this case, it, 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 just, it wasn't good, but she, she relented. It didn't take, she just said, sure. You know, I understand that. Go ahead and, and, and take it. Very selfish thing, by the way, I, as, as I think back on it. It, it is selfish because I'm literally, literally trying to tell a photo story while she's sitting here dying. So that, that's, that's one of the tough things. But you, you make those choices, and I think, I think a lot of us are selfish when it comes to it, because you want get, to get the picture. Um, but again, you, you've noticed a lot of wide shots, because they, they show the environment. You've got the counter. You've got the potato chips on the counter. It's not the cleanest thing going on right there but it's telling the story of the time that she was going through. I felt like I wanted to come in closer, cut out the other junk in the side of the images. Um, her friend made this blanket, sent it to her. 
but she was pale, she was cold, she couldn't get warm. It, it just, it, it wasn't, it just wasn't good. Now, moving around the back. To me, this is one of the more powerful images. Not just from a photographic standpoint that I got my lines pretty straight with a 14 millimeter, but I, I, I looked at this yesterday when I was going through these images. I don't go through them very often because it's one of the only things that, that makes me emotional is, is this. But this feels like one of those closing type of shots. It feels like a last ending type of shot. You've got the bright lights from outside. I mean, you want to think, I'm not thinking that when I'm shooting it, but I mean, you can think about it as, as, it's, as it's like, okay, this is the light, going into the light. This, if this was the last shot, from a storytelling perspective, this would be a closer. This would be an ending type thing. So, right around this time, she ended up falling, trying to go to the bathroom, you know, to make it to the bathroom, and she was hallucinating, and it went on for a couple of days. It just wasn't good. Um, my dad's like, we're gonna, we're gonna rush you to the hospital. We rush her down to Penn, one of the best hospitals there. She gets uh, into the ER, we roll her in, sorry, yeah, the emergency room, and we roll her in there. They take her back to be evaluated, and it's, um, you know, this is around this time, so it's right before the 2008 election. And I say something like, oh, you, you might, not get a, might not be able to vote for Obama, or whoever she was gonna vote for, which was Obama. And then, and then she basically flatlined. I was like, oops, was that my fault? I, I, I really think that that might have been my fault, because I said something that wasn't positive, and it, and it might have triggered something. Um, they bring in the paddles, they bring in the crash cart, they bring in a, an emergency team. They don't end up paddling her and they ended up stabilizing her. Her heart rate plummeted. She, she was not, not doing well at all. Um, they get her into the ICU uh, and I recall putting on, I brought a, the, the, remember the clip on iPods? The small one, the iPod, I don't know, whatever they called that. And I put a song on I, I, I hit, you couldn't tell what song was coming on, but the first one in the playlist was um, Frank Sinatra, uh, My Way, which was her favorite song. She also said, I want it played at my funeral. So I quickly changed that song, because that probably wasn't a good song to have on, but I heard, I heard that come on. Um, so her doctor was on vacation. They did get a hold of him. And they talked about that they could probably get her a month or two if they push the cancer out of the liver. They could do something. So the problem was she, she, she had a magic bullet pill they talked about, and that was some, something that they were trying at the time. And, and everything worked. I think we did one or two or three different things. It all worked, and then it didn't. And then they say when it morphs, you're fucked. That if your cancer keeps morphing, you're not, you're not going to... You're not going to kick it. They talked about giving her a month or two if we did this procedure or whatever they wanted to do, and we made the decision as a family that, you know, the, the, the best course of action was not to do it. Because if we did it, what's the point? You're going to be back in a month. And it's not like she had quality of life at that point. And so we made, we made that decision to, uh, to basically get her into hospice. But bef before we got her out of that hospital where they transported her to, to hospice, she became coherent. And she started recounting her entire life to everybody in the room. From childhood to teenage years to the, my, my brother and I. And it was, it was just weird. Because she went from being basically comatose to waking up and telling this story and then, and then, then going out again. And so they, they get her into hospice, and there, you know, if anybody's ever dealt with hospice, there's, there's no wires, there's no beeping, there's no sounds. It's just make you comfortable until it's time to go. Um, yeah, and, and she did. 
And so this ended up being the ending photo. This is a year after she died. She died two days into hospice. And you know, this is for the unveiling of the, uh, the tombstone. And if anybody doesn't know, we don't really bring flowers in Jewish cemeteries as much. You, you bring stones because they last longer and they stay there. And so these are all different stones. I brought a bunch back from Israel when I went. Um, but there was, there was an image I didn't take. Uh, we got the call that she, she passed away, and we were only five minutes from, from the hospice place. And we went, and we went into the room, and they have her laying there in the bed, hands crossed. And I, and I wanted to take a picture. I wanted to take that picture. And then I, I talked myself out of it, and I said, I don't think people will understand which I think I was wrong about. I, I should have taken it. I think that would have been, you know, in a photo story standpoint, a good storytelling image. But I also think it would be something that, it's been done before. People have done it, and I think it's very powerful. Unfortunately, it's, it's emblazoned in my brain, but I remember us going in and, you know, like I, I kissed her on the forehead, and she was already getting cold. And, and that was at the point I realized that you know, that's not my mom anymore. That's just a, a, the vessel that she was in. So that's, that's why I think that picture would have been pretty damn powerful. Um, but I, I think it's important to tell these stories, regardless of how emotional it is or painful it is to tell. This is one of the things that gets me emotional. It, it's just, it hits me. I don't look at these images very often. And I thought it, it was just what I wanted to share with you guys. Storytelling. You know, it's not about the gear here. No one cares what it was shot with. I mentioned it because I wanted to put the time stamp on it. But it, it doesn't matter what you shoot with. You can tell a photo story with your cell phone. You can tell a photo story with any camera. It doesn't matter. And at the end of the day, no one is looking at your images going, oh man, I wonder if you shot that with the latest camera or or if you used IAF or you used anything. Because it's just, it, it doesn't matter as long as you capture the moment and you tell that story. And so when you're telling the stories, don't be afraid to tell the things that have emotion. Don't be afraid to share it. Take the pictures you want to take. You know, I, I, I still wish I took that shot, but it, it's okay. I, I've forgiven myself for not taking the picture. It's not a, it's not a big deal. Um, it's emblazoned in my brain forever. So, really, the, the moral of the story here is you know, go out into the world and share your stories, whatever they are. You can turn anything into a photo story. Give it emotion. Capture the moments, the wides, the mediums, the tights, the details, and tell the stories that are there. And, and, and for personal projects, just do it. Just, just, just go out and do it. If you have an idea for something, figure out a way to do it. Get someone to say yes. All you need to do is you need to keep asking people. You're going to get a bunch of no's, but all it takes is one yes. And that's it. So I think that's where I'm going to end up leaving that one. Um, I know this was different than what most people would expect from me, because people don't personally know me. They know the guy I play on the internet, which is <laughs> technically me, mostly, just elevated to a different level sometimes. Um, but yeah, this is, this is a story I wanted to tell, and I hope you uh, got something from it. All right. So we have, we have time for Q and A. People probably have questions. Do we have questions? Just someone start yelling a question at me because I can't really see that far. How's my day going? It's okay. <laughs> I uh, got on a train this morning and got to New York. What was that? How's Steven? Steven's at home. He uh, just had a baby on Tuesday. Yeah. So he's, um, he's, he's taking whatever time he needs. We don't, we don't put a, a time stamp on whatever he needs with us. Like we, 
I, I want him back, but I gotta give him whatever time he wants he can have. I hope he's not watching to hear that. <laughs> but I've, to I've told him that a million times. The new studio is coming along, moved in. I'm not allowed to put things away because Steven is the OCD one. So there's a lot of stuff just waiting for Steven to come back to organize because that's, uh, that's his job. He likes to know where things are. I more put piles together in certain areas that I know where my stuff is. So I have my area, but the, the new studio is gonna be great. Uh, it's a great, great place to, to create and it's just a, another stepping stone for you know, what we do. What was my favorite part of the trip to France, the most recent one? Um, I think it was, I mean, one, I love Paris, I love baguettes. I like the French butter. That stuff is really, I, really, I like the food, the food's great. Um, I don't know, I, I liked, I, I took one camera, right? I, I didn't take the best of the best with Honor Sir. I took a, a, a Canon R8 and a 28 to 70, so I took not the greatest camera, but I took one of the greatest lenses ever, and that's what I shot with. Uh, and I felt that that was a, um, it was, it was, I like challenges, right? Like I just, B&H actually sent me a Fuji GFX 100S because I've never shot, Fuji doesn't send me stuff. Um, but I love the challenge of trying something different in a situation where people don't usually use those systems. I took it to the Phillies. Uh, you can go on my Instagram, Jared Poland. I, I don't have them here to pop up, but it's just a fun challenge to use something different. And the question is, do I normally mix my black and white with the color? So for me, selecting which way it goes is really just a, a feeling in the moment. Some images just call out to you to be black and white. They just feel better, at least to me. And so I like to go contrasty. I like to boomify them. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I mix them up. Um, I think that that helps get the point across. And I, and I also do think that sometimes certain images that do not work in color can be saved by going to black and white. I just feel it's something, you know, it's something classic about black and white. Um, can you turn your lens hood around though? If you're gonna... <laughs> Thank you. I have a thing with lens hoods. I just have a thing with lens hoods. They, they, they're there to be, yeah, that, that guy's got his lens hood properly done. Thank you. So yeah, a mix of black and white and colors for, for me is totally fine. Today? I didn't tell them. <laughs> um, I never asked, actually. I, I think they're fine. They, they understand me, that I'm gonna do it anyway, basically, but uh, they're, they're good images to have, no matter how painful they are. Um, I, I just think it's really important to share your emotion. There's nothing wrong with showing emotion, and, and you know, for the past, a lot of people were told to hide the emotion away. I find it hard to cry. This stuff makes me cry. And then I somehow just stop and I really want to let it go, but I can't. I don't know why, it's just always, it just, for some reason I stop. Do you still hide your emotions like you did back in 2008 behind the camera? The question is, do I still hide my emotions like I did in 2008 behind the camera? I think as photographers, we're meant to hide your emotions when you're shooting, right? I think that you need to be calm and in the moment. I have trouble with patience and waiting for things in everyday life, but when it comes to photography, I can stand somewhere for four hours waiting for that moment to happen, and I'm in it, and I'm cool with standing there waiting. Um, but I think it's important that you cut emotion out of what you do, because in certain situations, you just need to react. You need to be in the moment, and I like to say that I feel like I'm in moments where I see it happen before it actually happens, so that I'm ready to capture it when it does happen. I feel like the world is moving in slow motion and I'm moving at regular speed around to get the image. I don't know why that is, but that's how I feel like I shoot. Um, but I think it's important when you're documenting to not show a lot of emotion. Because I, I just think you need to be in tune with what's happening so that you can capture it and not, be not let the emotion blind you to getting the moment. My thoughts on AI in terms of photography and editing? Um, so my thoughts on AI are, I mean, it's technology that we need to learn. It's technology we need to figure out how to embrace and, and each person is gonna choose how much they wanna use it. 
So in photo, photojournalism, like my uh, Lionel Messi photos where I cut his toe off at the very bottom or cut half of his body off, people are like, well, why don't you use AI to grow the toe? I'm like, I could. I'm a guy who doesn't even crop my images, so I'm not going to turn to going to that to, to grow it. But there's benefits to it, right? AI has, I mean, there's so many things that it can do as a tool to help us be a better creative. So I wouldn't poo-poo it and just get, get rid of it. And there's AI softwares for editing your images. I'm trying to test some out. Some of them were too much of a pain in the butt to use, so I didn't end up using them yet. Um, but I'd like to see what they can do. But I still think I'm the best at culling down the images to the best of the best of the best with honor, sir, so that I can pick them. I mean, I show that in my, my latest, uh, it was the vlog with the Lionel Messi stuff. I took 600 and some photos and I ended up selecting 44 to edit, and of the 44, I edited it down to eight. Eight were the best of the best. They were the keepers. And I always tell people that you're the last line of defense between putting out quality and crap, and if you allow a crappy photo to go out that people don't like or that just doesn't represent what you do, that's your fault. So I don't, I'm not a fan of people taking 5,000 images or 8,000 images at a wedding and then delivering, de deliver, blah, delivering them. But if you take 8,000 images, and that's what you did, and then you edit it down to the best of the best, that's fine. Always show your best work. I I'm a little different with, with what I do on YouTube because I'm going to show you the not best stuff too. Because I want you to see that it's not all, those are the eight keepers, that's what I got and there aren't bad shots. There's always gonna be bad shots, and I think it's important to share that with everybody so that they see and they know that me, even as like a professional, doesn't get keepers every time. So, AI, I, I'm, for, I'm for it. It's like going from, from film to digital back in the day. The film photographers who said, digital isn't there, it's terrible, are the ones that got left behind. Because you have to learn the new technologies or you're gonna be left behind. So just embrace it. You're not gonna win, you're not gonna get it put back in the box where they're gonna be like, you know, the, the photographers and, and artists complaining that they trained AI with their images. I don't care. Train your, image, train your AI with me, it's gonna benefit me. It's like we've read books in the library, we've learned from different things. It's the same thing they're doing, they're filling that in and it's just moving quicker. At least that's my opinion. Where do you see yourself in like 10 years? Uh, 52. <laughs> So is where, where do I, eight Lambos, where do I see myself in 10 years? I, I, don't, I don't know, I, I try not to, uh, I mean I have ideas, I wanna have a, a property that has a bowling alley. You gotta have aspirations for something, like when I bought my first property, it was basically the one from Big. I always wanted the one, you know, the, the, the property from Big. I didn't put the trampoline in, my dad said if you, if you paralyze yourself, I'm not gonna take care of you, and that resonated, that made sense as an adult, don't get a trampoline in your apartment. So I, so I didn't. Um, 10 years, I, I just, I don't know, I don't ever see a time where I'm not creating, whether it's YouTube, whether it's something bigger that, I, that I'm trying to work on now that I wanna branch into different directions, but I still love creating. I still love giving the gift of photography. I'm in a position where I don't have to make money from what I do in the photo world because I generate revenue from the YouTube. I'm not ashamed to say that, I'm happy to say that because I think it's every photographer's goal to get to a place where you can shoot what you want when you want to and not have to worry about getting paid. So I just still want to continue to give the gift to people that may never have had the chance to get a great photo of themselves. I just love giving photo books. I love giving prints. I love giving images to people. Like I gave away the Lionel Messi photos. I put them up at 40 inches on the long side. They're up on, on Flickr. You can download them, use them for personal use. Because I just like, someone else is going to enjoy it. And not everything has to be for the money. Like when I do my six degrees projects where I spend the day in the life of somebody um, capturing their story and I pay for it. I pay for my travel, I pay for everything, my, my lodging. And the, the goal there is that they will connect me to the next person in the line. And then they connect me to the next and the next and the next. And the funny thing is, I've ended up getting paid for book covers from the photos that I've done there. Because you never know where it's gonna lead you. And you know, meeting more people and having those connections is super important. Because I like to be a super connector. I like to be able to connect someone that I know who needs help with something with somebody else that I know who could help them with that. So that's the stuff that makes me the happiest. The thing that makes me the least happiest is downtime where I'm doing nothing 
and loneliness. I don't like that. We see you at uh, a zoo or the Phillies game. If yeah. you were to go out and just shoot, not put it out on the internet, what do you shoot for yourself that we probably don't know about, but so just for fun? The question is, you, you see me shooting all over the place for, for content. What do I do shooting-wise for fun? Uh, <laughs> that, that's a good question because it's in the back of my mind that everything ends up being content. So photo stories are what I find to be fun um, and challenging. So there really isn't anything that I just go and shoot because I just shoot. It's always in the back of my mind, like, oh, I should show, I should put a, um, a camera on top of this. I should put a camera on my head. I should document everything that I'm doing. So it's like, it's a double-edged sword because I do these shoots for fun where it's capturing people or the photo stories but then I end up wanting to turn it into content. So I have to find the, the happy medium where it's a little bit of both. Well, hold on, we got two people coming here. What one can, say from, from, hist from history? <laughs> what camera, what lens, I mean, I've said that the D3 was a great camera. The D3S was the camera that launched my website because it gave me five minutes of video. I think that was one of the most perfect, greatest cameras ever made. Are things better now? Of course. Um, I would take that camera, that thing is fantastic, but I mean, shit, you got D3S, or sorry, you've got um, R3s, you've got A1s today, you've got Z9s, they're all fully capable. Uh, in terms of lenses, I mean, that 28 to 70 f2 is pretty damaging. You can do quite a lot of damage with one lens like that. So I think right now, that lens is, is pretty much a lens that I would have as a go-to. Nice. Right. Thank you for sharing. Thanks. Um, he was saying that I was invisible. What's my advice for that? I mean, that was the same thing I said about sneaking around the aisles when you're leaving and to be a fly on the wall. I mean, you're, you're going to be seen. People always say when they see me on stage at a concert, why didn't you wear black? Everybody knows you wear stage black. I'm like, fuck you, I wear purple. <laughs> you know, I want to be seen. I want to be seen on the back of the stage with my hair popping up from behind the drummer because I find it funny. People take pictures of that and they send it to me and I think it's cool. I, I don't think I need to blend in. I, I think that you know, if you respect the people you're shooting, they respect you, they respect the work that you do, they allow you to be there and just do what you need to do and not get in the way. Just stay out of the way. And it's okay every once in a while to say, hold that. Right, hold that to get that shot that you want because it's sometimes you miss certain things, but you just, I don't worry about it. I just, I'm in the area, I, I, I am a fly on the wall, you are gonna know that I'm there, but after a while they just understand based off of the work that you've done in the past that you're okay to be there. You're not trying to make them look bad. Um, and that, that's another thing is don't let out work that would make someone look bad that you don't, you shouldn't be putting out there. Um, you just don't want to, you don't want to do that. You, you, you don't get a lot of opportunities to mess up. And if you, you know, like paparazzis, I'm not a paparazzi fan. I just think it's terrible. I'd rather have you walk up to someone and ask to take the photo and see what they say. And then if they tell you no 73 times, maybe the 74th time, they're like, you know what, maybe I'll give this person a chance because they're not just trying to steal my picture to make money on the internet. Yeah, a couple more. I know I'm over time, but what time do we go until? Three more. Three more. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a classic street photography question. Um, what if you're on the street and you capture someone's image? Do you uh, do you ask them first, or do you take the picture? Well, it's public. You're in a public place. So this, this is a this is a this is a very gray area. I'm not a fan of the taking pictures of people that are down and out, right? 
homeless people and then trying to exploit that and be like, oh, isn't this something? I'm not a fan of that. I'm not a fan of some of the street photographers who will run around the street holding a flash and pop it in someone's face. I think that's disrespectful. They should be punched in the face. And I don't care <laughs> if, if you're in public. Like, there is no expectation of privacy in public, at least in this country as of right now. You can get away with, with doing that. Um, but you still need to be respectful. Uh, I've taken plenty of street style photos and some people are happy and some people are not. Misdirection is the key to taking pictures on the street. Like, I think Zach Arias talked about this back in the day. He was demonstrating. But I do it all the time where I'm looking through and shit, they see me. And then I look at the back of the camera. I, look, I point at something over there. I, point, I don't look at eye contact. I don't make eye contact and I just go about my business. Misdirection. Make it like you don't see them looking at you because you already got their picture. But that's the best way to get rid of that confrontation is like don't make eye contact. Just start looking at the... You know, that, that's important. What's my opinion on this? This guy's an asshole. <laughs> no, my online personality is very, this is, this is me. This is like anybody that hangs out with me knows, you know, there's different moods. Sometimes I'm super quiet and then other times I'm just super amped. Um, but this is, this is me. Like, I'm not playing a character on the internet. I may raise the level a little bit, but this, this, is, this is who I am. And I, I'm going to tell you the truth. Well, I'm going to tell you my truth, whether it's, you know, right? You have to step back. Not everything I say is, is fact. But I try to base everything that I do say based off of my experience, like using cameras. Why do I say certain things about certain brands? Because it, it, it ends up being true because I've, used the cameras for so long, and I've used every system at this point. And so being able to use every system and understanding the ins and outs and the quirks, you have a better idea that when you, when you see something wrong, you kind of know that it's right, and then you can support it. Make sure you always support it with sound facts. Any more? What, what advice would I give to up-and-coming photographers? In what sense? What are you trying to do? In the YouTube. I mean, photo the photo YouTube is an interesting animal. I'm not going to tell anybody not to do it. I think it's important to find your way. I think the key to starting a, a YouTube is make sure you can ride whatever trend is starting, because no one cares about my journey, right? No one's going to find my journey if you start. But if you decide that you have a piece of gear or something, gear is what's going to draw people. But try to be unique and original to you and not just copy what other people are doing. Um, and it's not easy. And just know that it's not going to happen overnight. Not everybody can be Peter McKinnon. <laughs> That's it? I, I'm done? I'm seven minutes and ten Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. One more time. Let's hear it for Jared. Right on. Wow.